I think Santa already introduced Kyle. Kyle's a prof professor of philosophy at King's College, and he's a doctor of rock and roll. And I, th I was just thinking we've got a couple of your, your members here. So um, <clears throat> if you were at our party a couple years ago, they were our uh, entertainment. Uh, Kyle's got several books out. He's got a blog. And um, today he will be selling his most, his recent book, which he'll be talking a little bit more about. So please join me in welcoming Kyle Johnson. Thank you. Oh, good. The mic's working. Oh, this is awesome. We'll put this here and put that there. All right. Uh, Diane, I need you to be my clicker once you get the PowerPoint up and running, because um, I couldn't get the clicker to work with. Uh, so I'm going to point at you, and whenever I point at you, just go to the next slide. Um, ah, there it is. All right. Good deal. Um, so yeah, so I'm David Kyle Johnson. I'm an associate professor of philosophy at King's College. Uh, I also teach for the great courses. I have a new course coming out in January on the big questions of philosophy. Um, should be pretty fun, 36 lectures. Different outfit every lecture, by the way. I'm very proud of that. Um, so uh, today, uh, the way I will rebut Santa's conjecture that he exists uh, is by providing you an origin story for Santa Claus. Um, let me go over the myths that are in the book in case you are interested, uh, and then I'll show where we're going to kind of zero in. So it's called The Myths of Christmas, Seven Misconceptions That Hijack the Holiday. Jesus is the reason for the season is myth number one. So all these are false, right? Uh, there is a war on Christmas. That's a myth. Our Christmas traditions are old-fashioned. That's myth number three. Christmas spending is good for the economy. I argue that it is not. Santa Claus is St. Nicholas. I argue that that is false, and you will see why here today. And the Santa Claus lie is harmless. I will also talk a bit about that today as well. That's myth number six. And then that Christmas can't change is myth number seven. So what I want to do is concentrate on what I think is one of the most fun myths in the book, which is the Santa Claus is St. Nicholas myth. We're going to debunk uh, that idea. And then I'll talk a bit about the Santa Claus lie uh, in, uh, uh, towards, towards the end. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so I'm not arguing, when we get to that point, when I argue against the Santa Claus lie, I'm not going to argue that we should eliminate the Santa myth from Christmas uh, entirely, um, or that it should be part of Christmas or whatever. Uh, for there's value in myths and fables and tradition, it's when we start, like with many myths, it's when we start mixing literal belief in with the myth that we start to have some problems. Uh, and so it's not that we should eliminate the myth, it's that we should stop teaching our children to literally believe that the myth is true. If you do that, do that I'm not saying that you're a bad parent, I'm just saying if you didn't do it, you'd be a little bit better. <laughs> All right, so um, next, please. Uh, so so but before we get to that, before we start talking about uh, this, we got to look at the history of Santa. And this will be my kind of debunking, uh, as it were, of, the, of, of, of Santa's claims that he exists. Because uh, it's, it's a, much like um, people often misuse the genetic fallacy in this way. If you can show that the origins of a belief do not actually trace, especially the belief in the existence of something, do not actually trace back to the thing that it is supposed to be a belief about, that's a pretty good reason for thinking that that thing doesn't exist. So if we realize that the origins of Santa, belief in Santa, do not originate in an actual fat man that lives in the North Pole, that's a pretty good reason for thinking that Santa Claus exists. In the same way that if we realize that humans invented the concept of God, and that the reason that we believe in God has nothing to do with actually a man in the sky, as it were, uh, then that's a pretty good reason for thinking that God doesn't exist if it's something that we made up. So Santa Claus is clearly something we made up, but how did we make, up? How did we make it up? How did Santa Claus get to be like he is, like he was right here in front of us with the red suit and the fur and the beard. How did it get to be that way? Well, um, the traditional story is this. That Santa Claus is an Americanization of Saint Nicholas, a Catholic saint who was a real person in history, a fourth century bishop from Myra. That's the classic story. However, when you stop to think about this, does it make much sense? At best, it's incomplete, and at worst, it is just outright False. All right? So, next slide, please. If you look at what, this is one of the earliest depictions of the historical St. Nicholas here on the left, and then you look at Santa Claus and you wonder, what exactly does Santa have in common with the historical St. Nicholas? 
when you compare what he looks like today, and you see, well, they're both male, right? They have a beard. And that's about it. There's not much going on there. There's, Nicholas does not have a, a white beard. He doesn't wear fur. He's not carrying a tree. He's not smoking a pipe. Uh, there's no holly involved there. Uh, he's not fat. Uh, there's, something happens between here and here that's missing, right, to explain how we got from there to there, right? So I want to try to fill out uh, that a bit. Um, go. Next one, please. So we wonder, where is St. Nicholas's stump of a pipe, his bag, his sleigh, his furry red suit? What happened to the Catholic robes? Uh, St. Nicholas didn't live at the North Pole, uh, have elves and slide down chimneys, or get all dirty and sooty. Uh, and where are Nicholas's bells? Right? St. Nicholas didn't have any bells, but Santa Claus definitely does. Santa Claus is not a jolly old elf who bounces like a bowl full of jelly as he laughs a hearty ho, 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 and he opens his pack like a peddler. Uh, why are Santa's reindeer named Donder and Blitzen, named after thunder and lightning, rather than something like faith, hope, and charity, if he's actually, you know, from a saint. Um, Santa Claus is the polar opposite of what a staunch Catholic bishop would be. He almost has nothing in common with the historical St. Nicholas except his name and gift giving. And beyond that, there's not much else. But maybe not even the gift giving is actually in common with the uh, historical St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas is thought to be a gift giver, and that element of Santa Claus lore is supposedly related to that belief. But here's the thing. Um, by the way, the text is mainly from me, uh, so don't feel obligated to read through all of this. Just listen to me, and if I read something there, you can read along with me. Uh, but that's basically to keep me, on, uh, keep me on track so I don't forget what to say. Here's the problem with the, uh, the, the gift giving story. So you may or may not know that there's this famous story about Nicholas, uh, the, the historical Saint Nicholas, uh, giving gifts to, three, uh, to, a, to a widower so that he could marry off his three daughters. So basically uh, he was a widower and he was afraid that he couldn't uh, marry off his three daughters because he couldn't afford a dowry. Uh, and so Nicholas uh, hears about this and uses his vast wealth and slips a bag of gold into the window of the, of the man's house. He uses it for a dowry to uh, marry off his oldest daughter. So he, if he didn't do that, he's gonna have to sell them in the prostitution. Uh, and so he does that. He uses the money in the, wise, in the best way, so he does it again and he does it again. He gets caught the third time, and he, Nicholas makes the man promise not to tell anyone it was him because uh, he wants to be humble about it. Clearly, he didn't keep his promise since we're talking about the story right now, right? The problem with thinking, that, however, that this is actually a story about the historical St. Nicholas is that the story predates Nicholas. It is actually true of a Greek philosopher named Apollonius. Actually, it may not even be true of Apollonius either, but the story was attributed to Apollonius long before Nicholas would have been around. Uh, and so clearly, this is just an example, we'll actually see a lot of this, of a story about someone else being popped onto, being assembled by, or assembled, uh, uh, you know, consumed by Nicholas and, and tacked onto Nicholas' lore uh, as a way to probably explain why eventually gifts were given in his name. So. Uh, it's very unlikely that, this, that Nicholas was actually a wealthy gift giver or anything like that. This story just popped on a Nicholas lore from Apollonius. Um, so appealing to the historical Nicholas doesn't even answer the, where do the why does Santa give gifts question either, right? Uh, and neither does it answer the where does, the Santa, Claus, uh, where does Santa Claus come from question uh, either. So in fact, just about every story about Nicholas finds its origin in some divine being that predates him or otherwise is known to be false. Uh, Nicholas is the patron saint of damn near everything. Um, I'm quoting someone there, I can't remember who it is, but uh, um, that he, I mean, he's the, sa he's the patron saint of children, he's the patron saint of sailors, he's the patron saint of prostitutes. Prostitutes have a patron saint and it is Santa Claus, all right? Um, the three daughters, the chaste life, that he gave away all his worldly possessions, that he saved a condemned man from death and can appear in two locations at once, that's actually all Apollonius. Those were all stories that were true of Apollonius, well, not true, but attributed to Apollonius uh, long before St. Uh, St. Nicholas came along. He has seafaring miracles. He rescues seafarers. He walks on water. He calms storms and showing up on, on board to help sailors. Yeah, that's all Poseidon. Those are all stories from Poseidon that got added on to St. Nicholas lore. Rescuing boys in a barrel. Looks like this is a unique story to Nicholas. It, it's attributed to him much later. But most likely, that's actually attributed to a different story that was borrowed. So there's another story that was borrowed and locked onto uh, to Nicholas lore that had to do with St. Nicholas rescuing prisoners in a tower. 
And there's a painting of this story where Nicholas is coming back from the dead, and he's this giant figure uh, visiting these people in this kind of castle tower, as it were. And if you look at that painting, it looks like a giant person visiting three boys in a barrel, not prisoners in a tower because of how big Nicholas is. And so someone reinterprets that painting, and we get this story about Nicholas rescuing these three boys that had been basically pickled by a butcher and he was going to serve them, and Nicholas finds out about it, and so he goes to the barrel and resurrects them out of the barrel, right? Um, so even, uh, oh, uh, and, and then there's this. So there's one story that supposedly uh, is historical of Nicholas, and that is the fact that he uh, punched the, the heretic Arius at the Council of Nicaea uh, for proclaiming what was soon to be declared heresy, that Jesus was not fully divine. So Arius is a, this, this person who doesn't think Jesus was fully divine, and Nicholas punches him. Right? So this is supposed to happen at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, you could find a version of this story in Kirk Cameron's movie, Saving Christmas, uh, and it is horrendous. It basically has Nicholas dragging him outside and just like that, and he's, and he's supposed to be a giant hero. Um, Problem with this is, is that this story is not attributed to Nicholas until much, much later, uh, way after the fourth century. Uh, and it seems actually to be, the best explanation for where the story comes from, uh, seems to be that it was invented as an explanation for why Nicholas is not actually on the bishop's roll for the Council of Nicaea. Uh, they kept roll, they lowered all, down all the bishops, and he's not on that roll. Now, technically speaking, he's on, there's, there are different copies of that role, and he's actually on a couple of them, but he's missing from most of them. And so this story is supposed to explain why he's missing from the roles. Oh, well, when he hit Arius, he did it from the emperor, so they take his bishop status away, and they only had a record of bishops, and so they had to you know, take off his name, because he was defrocked as a result of punching Arius. Um, likely not. If he'd punched somebody in front of the emperor, he probably would have lost his hand. Um, what's more likely, however, is that he was never on the role to begin with and that as monks copied down the role through the Middle Ages, as they were apt to do, if they thought something was missing that needed to be added, like when they see that the Jewish historian uh, Flavius Josephus doesn't have any mention of Christ being the Messiah in his history, well, they'll just gladly add that in as they, as they copy it, right? And so as Nicholas lore gets started um, and belief in Nicholas becomes common, monks are copying down the role from Nicaea, and they see Nicholas missing. Well, he was alive at that time, right? He should... Ah, he was probably there, and they would add him in. But only a couple monks did that, and so that's why he's on a couple of the roles, but missing from most of, most of them. Right? Even the Catholic Church, if you look it up uh, from, from their encyclopedia, basically, admits that all we know about St. Nicholas is that he was a bishop from Myra in modern Turkey in the 4th century. That's it. Everything else about Nicholas is lore. Everything else. But, I argue, I think even that is lore. I think that St. Nicholas never actually existed as a historical person. Now, this would not be a giant revelation. It certainly is a not mainstream view. But a lot of Catholic saints didn't actually historically exist. And you can actually thank the Jesuits for this. The Jesuits actually went through their calendar and tried to figure out which saints were actually historical and which ones were basically just appropriated pagan gods. And the Jesuits themselves admit some biggies. St. Christopher, St. Valentine, St. Demetrius, St. Martin. All of them are not historical saints. St. Martin is just the Roman god Mars, sainted. Um, and the reason, that the, the reason that this happened, and we, we, I've talked about Christmas, I've been here talking about Christmas before. We talked about like, Christmas history, like the holiday history before. Uh, and one of the things that comes up that you realize there is that as uh, a lot of our Christmas traditions happened, uh, because as Christianity roamed, uh, rolled through Europe, it absorbed a lot of different pagan traditions, right? Well, one of the things it did is as it went through, it find these pagan places of worship, and you had edicts from the Pope at the time basically saying, don't destroy them. That's a good place to, to worship, right? Just Christianize them. Go in there, sprinkle some holy water, take out the idols if you can, and if you can't, like if there's a carving to a god on the wall, just appropriate it to a Christian purpose. That's not the god Mars. That's St. Martin, right? That way when people just continue praying to it, we can say they're kind of doing something that's Christian. They're praying to St. Martin. Well, the reason I think this is also true of St. Nicholas, that he is just an appropriated pagan god, is because the first historical mention of him isn't until 440, 
which would be 100 years after his supposed death, not his life, not his birth, but 100 years after his death. And what, what we have in 440, it's all borrowed mythical stories. It's nothing historical. If had, we had a Nicholas Treatise or something in there, maybe we think there's some kind of historical ground there, but it's all mythical stories that we know are myth. The first biography is in until the 700s, and it's completely unsourced. We have no idea where this guy got this biographer, got his information about Nicholas, right? Multiple places claim to have his remains. That'd be kind of hard if you were an actual historical person, but if you're just made up, it's real easy, and the Catholic Church was really good at this at the time of just kind of making claims of, oh yeah, we've got a bone from the hand of St. Martin. In fact, I've even seen a supposed bone from the hand at St. Martin at Notre Dame. St. Martin didn't exist. That's just some bone that somebody found somewhere and then declared it to be of St. Martin, right? Uh, there's ad hoc stories that try to explain why Nicholas's bones are in different places, but they're ad hoc stories. They're not very good. Um, as intellectually honest as the Jesuits are, I just don't think they could bring themselves to admit that everyone's favorite saint didn't actually exist. So they didn't remove him completely. They actually did make his feast day optional, like they did some of the other ones, but they didn't go so far as to admit that he didn't actually historically exist. We're going to see some more reasons for thinking that St. Nicholas probably didn't exist as we go through. Go ahead. Of course, I did not tell St. Nicholas this. When I met him uh, in Mifflinburg at the Chris Crindle Market, um, Chris Crindle Market's really, it's, it's very fun. That's a good thing if they have a full-size St. Nicholas running around um, with the bishop's hat, much more like you'd find him in Europe. Um, go ahead. Converting pagans is hard work, and the church often simply appropriate existing myths. Uh, this often invoked taking stories of pagan gods, tacking them onto existing saints. Uh, in the 8th century, when the Norse were being Christianized, St. Nicholas got a lot of Odin's stuff. So lore about St. Nicholas does exist about this time, and this is when St. Nicholas starts changing into something different. So we go from this picture here, and then as we start you know, Christianizing the Germans, he slowly turns into this, and then this, and then eventually this. Now, how did this happen? Where are these elements coming from? Well, largely, go ahead, uh, largely from Odin. Odin has a lot in common with St. Nicholas. Uh, this is Odin riding Seletopur. Uh, his white eight-legged, notice the eight legs, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Eight-legged flying horse, notice the white beard. Go to the next slide. Uh, here's another good one of Odin. I like that one. Nice big white beard, flying eight-legged horse. You see the, the legs here? All right. Go ahead. Um, this is where St. Nicholas gets this white horse or donkey, but usually a horse uh, that he uh, rides around in Europe. And it is a flying white horse. This is how he makes his visits. He gets it from Odin. The Norse believed that Odin brought dead warriors back from the earth during blizzards late in the year. Basically, they thought all hell was breaking loose because whenever you huddle down in a small house while the blizzard's going on outside, it sounds like all hell is breaking loose. So Odin basically was thought to come back with dead warriors from the previous year, and they would go through the land. Often one of the spirits that believed to accompany Odin was the earth goddess named Birchta. She would visit your house bestowing blessings or curses, and you would leave a little treat out for her uh, in order to influence her decision about whether she would bless or curse your house. Uh, and oats for her horse. In Scandinavia, the traditions combined and became more concrete. Yulebuck, uh, who is also said to be Odin, would visit and deliver actual presents uh, to children, not just a blessing on the house. Notice the goat. That will be important in a little bit. Um, all this went down around New Year's, but when they adapted the, adopted the Roman calendar, that moved it to December 6th. And it ended up being Christianized and turned into St. Nicholas, right? Of course, today is December 6th. Notice that the day on which we celebrate St. Nicholas's death has nothing to do with some kind of historical record that we know when he actually died. That date was borrowed from this tradition, right? So you can't say, oh, we know when he died. That's how we know he's historical. No, we don't. We borrowed that date, right? Uh, around the 1100s, this was given over to St. Nicholas. It became a day in which uh, commemorates his death and the day when he returns to earth to decide whether children uh, have been good enough to deserve his gifts. French nuns did this uh, to deliver gifts. French nuns first did this in the 1100s, uh, decided to deliver gifts in St. Nicholas's name. So that's how late that tradition uh, pops up. So the mythical Nicholas of the 1100s has a bit more in common with, the, with Santa than the historical Nicholas, right? 
Uh, you have December gifts. You've got gift giving, flying livestock, big white beard. But much is still not accounted for, and we still wonder from where did St. Nicholas come? If St. Nicholas isn't a historical person, well, then where did lore about St. Nicholas come from? What god was sainted in order to create St. Nicholas like the other saints? Well, answering that question is going to take, uh, well, go to the next slide. Why does Santa Claus have a boy tied up to a tree about to beat the hell out of him with birch rods? This is a pre-World War I European postcard. It's legit. It's a real thing that people would send to each other at Christmas. <laughs> right? Be good for goodness sake. Go to the next one. This is the cover for the book. Why is Santa Claus stuffing a little boy in a sack? <laughs> a terrified little boy. Um, what is going on here? Right? Well, explaining these, why these are Christmas. I love this. A Merry Christmas. <laughs> right? Explaining why these are Christmas cards, these European traditions, is going to help explain where Santa Claus comes from. But to get there, we're going to have to go back about 300,000 years. Next slide. So, I'm sorry, what did I just say? 300,000, 30,000 years. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, ancient people used to worship many animal gods. They were kind of animal men hybrid gods. Uh, this is an old cave painting. It's got like four different animals kind of pushed into it. Uh, often, uh, well, one of them actually appears in uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of our, one of our oldest stories. It's this kind of half man, half beast story that serves as, as the brother uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that painting. This is an old cave painting in France. There's my 30,000 years. Um, so quite often these, 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 uh, these gods were half man, half goat. Go ahead. Um, and... It's a, it's a god that it wouldn't have one name. It's one that Skeefer calls the wild man. Skeefer's got this great book called Santa Claus Last of the Wild Man. She calls it the wild man. This wild man was a nature god that was kind of supposed to be unified with the land. And the idea was, because it was half man, half animal, and the idea was that, if you guys are familiar with the King Arthur tradition, that King Arthur's health, like the king's health is, 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 is uh, attached to the, the health of the land, so that if the king is sick, the land is sick, and if the king is well, the land is well, right? Uh, There's a great scene in Excalibur where the king revives and the land is reviving again. Um, well, the same idea was, was here. And so that if the land was sick, the wild man must be getting sick. And so what people would do is a priest would dress up as the wild man. And people would go, people in the town uh, would go out uh, and capture the wild man. Uh, he was also thought to be not only a nature god, but a fertility god. They would often uh, uh, draw him out with like a young maiden or something like that. The, um, the wild man would come out, they would chain him up, and then they would drag him through town um, or lead him through town on chains. Um, this is how you'd always hear him coming through the chains rattling, right? Uh, and he would often have some kind of fertility symbol like a, uh, like a, like a, a phallus or a, uh, sometimes even a tree uh, or other kind of threatening symbol. He'd make threatening gestures as they, as they brought him through town. They would bring him to the center of town and then they would kill him and then resurrect him. Now, are they really killing him? Uh, maybe sometimes. And if they did, the resurrection would, well, I, mentioned, I forgot to mention this part. Before they killed him, they would actually have him copulate with a young woman in the middle of the, of the town square, right? So, he's a fertility god. Remember that, right? So, if they did kill him, it was the offspring and the young maiden that was his resurrection. But often it would be a show, right? They would pretend to kill him. How many people know they're pretending around him? I don't know. And they'd have a doctor come out and do a little thing, hocus pocus, booba booba, and then he comes back to life. And because he comes back to life, he revives, that revives the land as well. And so this was their way of ensuring, they thought, of spring, they're ensuring spring's return, a way to keep the spring coming back every year. And so they would do this tradition over and over. Um, Make sense? All right. So this goat god is very ancient, and it ended up influencing a lot of different deities. Uh, more than likely, this is why the Norse god Odin has the horns, because the wild man was usually half goat, and wearing horns was one way to symbolize that. Uh, the Greek god Pan, he's got those goat legs, right? Everybody knows Pan with the goat legs in the bottom, little horns. He's influenced by the wild man. And in fact, interestingly, Pan's kind of, a, kind of low in the totem pole in the Greek god pantheon, but originally he was the main guy. All the other gods were kind of versions of him. This is why panoramic means all-encompassing. Pan means all. He was the all, and the other gods were subservient to him, or basically kind of parts of him. He just eventually gets moved down. Go ahead. Um, four. 
rode around in a flying chariot pulled by two goats. And they were called Nasher and Cracker. Go to the next one. You'll see another good one of uh, Thor's battle with Ettens. You see the goats here. A little bit darker, but here's the goats. Um, go to the next one, I believe. And here's another one. Nasher was the word for thunder in Old Norse. And Cracker was the thunder uh, word for lightning in Old Norse. Thor was later uh, popular for the Germans. Thunder in German is Donner or Donner. Lightning in German is Blitz or Blitzen. And Donner and Blitzen is actually a common German phrase, like kind of like, hi, caramba, uh, for, for Bart Simpson. Uh, but if you were to be, you know, express, uh, express you know, shock, you would say, Donner and Blitzen. Right? <laughs> so you can obviously see some influence starting here. Right? Go ahead. Then there's also Holden the car. He's hard to do research on. But notice, he was a German gift-giving god. Notice again, the goat. The wild man, death and resurrection, likely had some influences as well. Um, 4000 BCE, you have the Mesopotamian Zagmuk, where they're, and we talked about this the last time I was here, where you had some killing the kings, so they could descend into the underworld to bring the spring back and that kind of stuff. Uh, the Persian and Babylonians have Seika. And the wild man was uh, the first god to be, wild man was the first god to believe to be resurrected, but he was not the last, right? The Egyptians had Osiris, the Babylonians had Tammuz, and the Christians had Jesus, right? Likely those kinds of influences about a resurrecting god uh, are influenced by this old wild man tradition. Go ahead. Um, the wild man was often called Klaus, or uh, if you were to say it with a German accent, Klaus. Klaus. Uh, and even through the Middle Ages, people worshipped the goat man, participated in the, in the rituals, sometimes all the way through to the 1900s. In an effort to depose this god, to keep people from worshipping it, from it, you know, kind of. Uh, the Christianizing people, the church basically did three things to try to depose him. One, they took the water, what I call the water boy approach. Have you seen the water boy with uh, uh, Adam Sandler? His mom doesn't want him to play football, and so what does she do? If I remember, foosball's the devil, right? Don't play the foosball, foosball's the devil, right? Well, basically, that's what they did with Claus. Right? They, they, people still wanted to, the, the priests and stuff to participate in the ritual to make sure the spring came back. And the Pope said, don't do that. Wild man's a devil. Don't do that. Secondly, they made the claws a sidekick. And thirdly, it seems that they may have actually made the claws a saint himself. So go to the next slide here. Um, this is the time when Satan went from this to this. Now, this is an actual ancient portrait. But if you look up old depictions or descriptions of, of uh, Satan from that time, he doesn't look like this. He's either a bolt of lightning or a snake or he's just literally an angel that's falling or something like that. After this, whenever the Pope makes this declaration, that's when he gets the horns, and the hooves, and the goat legs, and the pitchfork. Right? Uh, and then, of course, later these. <laughs> right? South Park, Futurama, Tenacious D, that's Doctor Who, and I don't know where this guy comes from, but he's funny. So this is where Satan gets his signature look, is from the wild man, right? This half man, half goat god. In fact, the wild man, now the devil, even got a popularity boost uh, from the church's effort to supplant village plays. Uh, they didn't, these village plays, were, they were secular things, the church didn't like them, and so to, to counteract them, basically, uh, the church put on their own village plays that told Bible stories and that kind of stuff, right? But just like Today, when the church tries to appropriate pop culture to, get, to gain popularity, it's lame. Think Christian hard rock, right? Like, people don't really like it, right? So to spruce them up, they introduced some comic relief. And that comic relief was in the form of Satan. They made Satan or the devil uh, that looked like the wild man their comic relief for these village plays. And so as comic relief, his catchphrase, his entrance phrase often when he came onto the stage was ho, ho, ho. And that's how he made his entrance, because he is the comic relief. And so now we're seeing even more similarities between Santa Claus and the wild man. Um, he was often the bad guy. And just like today, people love Darth Vader. They love the upcoming Kylo Ren. They love Jango Fett. They love the Joker. They love the villains. People love the villain. People love the devil. And actually got kind of a popularity boost uh, from these uh, village plays. Go ahead. Um, and of course, the Nick Klaus became St. Nicholas, 
right? And so what I'm arguing is that, um, well, let me put it this way. Um, if your name is Nicholas in America, your nickname is Nick, right? But in Germany, if your nickname is Nicholas, you do not go by Nick. You go by the latter half of your name, Klaus. Niklaus, your name, you go by Klaus. Well, that was the wild man's name, Klaus. And so if you were to saint him, you would obviously call him by his full name, and so you would get Saint Niklaus. Right? And then this just becomes Saint Nicholas. Right? And then once Saint Nicholas is created, once he's around, to depose the goat god even further, what they do is they make the Klaus Saint Nicholas's sidekick. Go ahead and go to the next one. So that if you are visited by Saint Nicholas in Europe, he often has a companion in tow with birch rods, often a long, disgusting red tongue. Go to the next one. Often he's furry, usually, at least from here down, usually in fur uh, from his head to his foot. Uh, notice the chains, reminiscent of the old wild man tradition of leading the wild man uh, through the town. Go ahead. There's a good one. Chains, birch rods, right? Visiting, leave gifts in the shoe if they've been good. Go ahead and go to the next one. Today, this tradition still exists in Europe. Uh, if you go to Germany or Austria, uh, you will see St. Nicholas and many wild men uh, in tow. This version's probably uh, called Krampus. Uh, so we can say these are mini Krampi uh, in uh, following St. Nicholas around. Uh, notice the bells here, if you can see those. Go ahead. Here's another good one. He's chasing the bad little children. He's got a basket on his back. That one's filled with uh, uh, apples. Go ahead and go to the next one. Um, often he would uh, get after the older women as well. There's some fertility going on here. Some fertility, some of the old fertility deity stuff going on here, influencing what's going on here. And St. Nicholas, <laughs> Nicholas is the peeping Tom in the window, right? Um, but he's the one, that, he's the punisher. He's the one that brings the punishments for being bad. I love this one. So St. Nicholas, this is the Chris Crindle. We go on all about that. Um, and then here's the Krampus in the, in, the, in the doorway. Notice the chains. The, ba the, 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 the sack is empty. We'll see what that sack is for here in a minute. Uh, dog doesn't like Krampus very much. Little girls, not no problem. They've been good, so they are faithfully looking at uh, St. Nicholas in expectation. <laughs> Little boys, not so much. They are scared of Krampus in the doorway. And Krampus has his sack because, uh, go, go to the next one, I'm sorry. Go to the next one, and then we'll go back to that one, if that's, okay, if that's all right. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm misremembering the order of my slides. Go back one. So um, we'll see what the sack is for here in a minute. So uh, throughout Europe, St. Nicholas was basically the same, but the sidekick took slightly different forms. In the Netherlands, he's Black Peter. In Germany, he's Kent Rupert. And in Austria, he is Krampus. Uh, so now go to the next one. This is Black Peter in the Netherlands. Um, there's been some controversy about this lately. Can you imagine why? <laughs> right? Uh, in fact, uh, just this year, uh, I think I got to mention this in the book. I made a last, kind of last minute revision. Um, just this year, there was a large school district in the Netherlands that said, yeah, we're not doing this anymore. We'll have, we'll have a Peter, but he's not going to be a black Peter anymore. We're not doing the black face. We're not doing some of the other stuff uh, that usually goes with it. Um, for Black Peter, that is a bag of presents he does have. Go to the next one. There's another one. He often arrives by boat, sometimes with many Black Peters in tow. Um, uh, this is, it comes from when uh, the Netherlands were ruled by Spain, and including the Moors lived at Spain. And so it was kind of, it was derogatory. It really was a kind of way, like, we don't like the Spaniards, and so we'll make them want a, a sidekick to St. Nicholas. It was a very common way of kind of demonizing uh, certain characters. Go to the next one, please. Uh, this is uh, German Kent Rupert with uh, St. Nicholas there. You can see the horns on the top and the basket. Now, what's that basket for? Go to the next one. Um, long red tongue for Krampus. You can see the basket on his back there again. Uh, usually a cloven foot, uh, sometimes a cloven foot and then a, then a human foot. Um, Grub von Krampus. Uh, greetings from Krampus, I believe is what that means. Go to the next one. There we go. <laughs> so what is the basket for? Hauling bad kids away. Stuff the kids into the basket to haul them away. This one's just awful. Look at that. 
right? But notice, cloven foot, human foot. Um, here he's being a little randy with an older woman there. Um, and this is an actual picture of somebody portraying Krampus. Uh, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So if you've been bad, he might pull your ears, stuff you in a sack, or add you to his chains and haul you off to hell. <laughs> All right? He is a mean, mean figure. Um, but he just wants you to be good. All right? Notice the human foot and cloven foot there again. Uh, so these are all postcards from the European uh, era, pre-World War I European era. Uh, there's, I got some of them in the book, got some really good ones in the book. Um, an, an author named uh, Monty Bichamp let me uh, use some of his, he's got actually two books on Krampus, one from 2004, one through 2010, that is all just Krampus postcards. That's fantastic. Go ahead. This is what Krampus looks like today. If you were to go to Austria last night and watch Krampus Loft, they actually have young men get drunk, they get dressed up on these things, and they do this giant parade that goes through the town. Uh, and they literally drag fire behind them that's metaphorically the fires of hell. Um, and people line up, and they'll, in these costumes, will go up to people and threaten them, and, and, that kind of, and they'll beat them with their birch rods and that kind of stuff and try to scare them, and the people love it. Uh, I've never been able to find it again. One time I saw a video of a mall, like in Austria, and Satan, the, the, the doors open, and St. Nicholas walks in, and then behind him is like 10 Krampi. And, they, and, and the people just gather around, and I mean, everybody just loves it. They're going around beating people and threatening them, and they, they love it. So this is what he would look like. Go to the next one. That's one of my favorites. You imagine that as a nice little Christmas tradition. All right, go ahead. Um, Krampus has ties with fertility. He often will kidnap uh, older women, or we have one here where he's proposing. Go ahead to the next one. Um, try to <laughs> flirt with the ladies from the 20s. Um, he's even copping a feel there on the right. Um, go to the next one. And he will kidnap uh, uh, young women as well here. These are both two very, very similar ones. Uh, and then he will incite couples to lust. <laughs> All right. And then I'll just leave this one here. <laughs> that is what you think it is. All right? So we can see Krampus is for ties to that old fertility deity in these postcards. Go ahead. So the same demon pair were continually rejoined. Like they would be separate, and then they would be joined in together into one character, separated again, just depending on where you found, what village you found yourself, what tradition you found yourself in. In Germany, Kench Rupert sometimes appears by himself playing both the role of gift giver and punisher. So here's Kent Rupert here by himself with the horns, but also giving the gifts. And although you might see depictions of St. Nicholas without a sidekick, he never visited homes without his sidekick. In fact, as soon as we see records of St. Nicholas making, making visits, he's already got the wild man uh, in tow. So these make a lot more sense now. Right? These are just more modern depictions of the St. Nicholas and Punishing Visitor pushed into one character. Right? And that's why this gift giver, gift giver figure is also punishing, because he's doing both roles at once. Uh, he's wearing red, notice. He's wearing blue. Right? We'll talk about that in a minute. So, all right. So often those who did without St. Nicholas were Protestants. They had no patience for Catholic saints, but they didn't want to get rid of this punishing tradition, like they like this tradition. This included the Dutch who immigrated to New York. They did not bring St. Nicholas traditions with them in any form. The Dutch who immigrated to New York were Protestants, so they didn't have any use for St. Nicholas. They weren't bringing the St. Nicholas tradition with them. This also included immigrants, uh, uh, German immigrants who settled in Pennsylvania. They had a combo gift giver, uh, and they called him, it was a Nicholas man hybrid that they called Furry Nicholas. So it was a Saint Nicholas, but he wasn't sainted anymore. They're not Protestants. And they combined the two visitors into one, and they basically had Saint Nicholas wearing the furs and other elements of the Krampus uh, lore. And they turned him into Peltznickel or Belgenickel. All right? uh, often the, hy the, 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 the hybrid's chains softened a bit and became bells so that you'd hear Krampus and St. Nicholas coming when you hear those chains rattling, right? Well, now with Bell's Nickel, you don't hear chains rattling, you hear bells. A lot of the Kramp Krampuses in uh, the Krampi in Austria now have giant cow bells that they wear in addition to their chains. So you can hear the parade coming with just this giant, ka-clang, 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 and it just, you can hear for miles. 
Um, so when you heard the bells, you know that Dirk Belsnickel was on the way. Um, harder to see here, but there's bells around the, the bottom here. Uh, no, 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 don't worry about that, don't worry about that. Uh, if you want to see them, just Google Belgenickel, and you'll actually find some uh, videos of me with Belgenickel um, at the, uh, because you could actually, I actually saw him yesterday. Um, in Kutztown, just down the road, they preserve a lot of the old German Pennsylvanian traditions, uh, and this is one of them they do. They have a guy that dresses up as Belgenickel every year. In fact, go to the next slide. There he is in 2010, that's me with Bell's Nickel in 2010. Uh, so they do a bunch of different Christmas traditions. You can go to the schoolhouse and he shows up at certain times. He's got his birch rods there. He's got his bag uh, there for uh, giving the little candy and nuts and that kind of stuff. Uh, go to the next one. Uh, this is in 2011. That picture's actually in the book, that right one there. Uh, go to the next one. This was last year's. He added horns in 2014, which I think is awesome. Uh, and that's my little boy, Johnny. Right there, loving, loving Belsnickel, he's my boy. Um, so Belsnickel would actually, just like St. Nicholas did, would actually visit houses. People would dress up as this character and go to house to house and people would give like gifts or food or money in exchange for the kind of performance they would put on for the kids. And when Belsnickel would visit, he was both a gift giver and punisher and so often what he would do, he would say, well I've got, I've got you know, nuts and candies here and he would throw them on the ground. This is one way people could do through the tradition, throw them on the ground but he wouldn't say you could get them yet. And if the kids started getting them, he'd get the birch branches out and start whipping them as they went to go get the candy. Um, so it was a very fun tradition. Uh, so a visit fame from St. Nicholas, uh, the poem is really where Santa Claus gets a big, huge lift. Uh, published in 1823, claimed by Clement Clark Moore in 1844, Hibbert and Linnery's junior family claims it, but likely it's not really his. It most likely was Moore's. If it had been Livingston's, it would have been more authentically Dutch because Livingston was Dutch and he would have understood that tradition. It is not. The, Saint Nicholas, the, the, the visit from St. Nicholas poem is decidedly not Dutch. It looks like someone who kind of fancied themselves Dutch appropriating a, an existing Dutch tradition and then kind of morphing it to their needs. That fits more to a T because he and the Knickerbockers did this basically with all of Christmas. They basically kind of appropriated the myths and the lore around it to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish, which was basically chain domesticating Christmas. They wanted to domesticate Christmas. We talked a bit about that last time I was here talking about Christmas. Um, but it was mainly a raucous holiday of drinking, feasting, and sex at the time, and it involved poor people trying to get into rich people's houses. Uh, and so more in the Knickerbockers, the rich New Yorkers didn't like that, and so they tried to domesticate it, and they did that by taking this old St. Nicholas tradition and morphing it with this poem, and then publishing that poem everywhere that they could. And it caught on like wildfire. And that's now why people trick their children into believing that St. Nicholas comes and visits every year, right? But if you look at that poem, he's called St. Nick, but he's not anything like St. Nicholas. In fact, most people don't realize in the poem, he's an elf, literally a tiny little person with a miniature sleigh and a tiny reindeer. That's how he fits through the chimney. He doesn't need any magic. He just fits because he's small. He's covered in fur from his head to his foot, just like Krampus, right? This is actually the first depiction of St. Nicholas that went with the poem. The first time it was published with a, an illustration, that's what St. Nicholas looked like. He looked like a little peddler opening his pack, covered in fur. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And it was in response to a sailing that this tradition uh, was, uh, this was sailing tradition was when the poor were trying to get into the rich people's houses. Go ahead and go to the next one. So it's often said that Santa Claus is just an Americanization of uh, the St. Nicholas's Dutch name, Sinterklaas. But the gift giver was already called Old Santa Claus in 1810 before St. Nicholas was being popularized in America. And remember, the immigrating Dutch left St. Nicholas behind. Claus or Klaus or Claus was already part of the wild man's name and often accompanied with the description of him, like the Rue Claus would be the Rough Claus. Sinsterklaas may have been what the Dutch called St. Nicholas, but translated Sinsterklaas does not mean St. Nicholas. It just means St. Klaus. Sinster Klaus, that's all it means, is Saint Claus. And that is what Santa is, a sainted version 
of the wild man called Claus. Santa Claus' name and look is simply an Americanization of what he is, a saintly version of the wild man, Saint Claus. All right, go ahead. In the poem, Santa's a dirty little elf. So how did he become a fully grown, rotund person living at the North Pole? Well, mainly with help from Thomas Nast and a little sprinkling of Coca-Cola. Um, Thomas Nast basically starts redepicting St. Nicholas, and he does it as a full-grown person. This is a, a, world, a, a Civil War era one where he's, drivel, he's, he's delivering presents to Union troops in 1863. Uh, the German Thomas Nast 1881 depiction of Santa Claus as a full-grown person, not an elf. That comes in 1881. That one really catches on like wildfire. Uh, go ahead to the next one. And Thomas Nast has a depiction of Santa at the North Pole. It's hard to read, but it actually says North Pole on the box here. Um, it was supposedly a vantage point by which he could like observe all the children. Go ahead. But the red and white comes from Coca-Cola. The reason that Santa Claus looks exactly like he did standing here in front of us with the red fur and the white trim is because in 1931, um, Bloom was the, was the author's name, I believe, um, started an ad campaign where they took Santa's pipe away and gave him a Coca-Cola bottle, and they made his uniform Coca-Cola red. And that ad campaign was so popular, it just took off. And so much so that now, if Santa Claus does not look like a Coca-Cola ad, it's not really Santa Claus, right? But that's where the image comes from. And they still dominate. They still corner that market on Santa Claus. Um, so go ahead. So that's where Santa Claus comes from. There's, I, I, I go into more detail in the book, but that's, that's the basics. Um, so quickly, how am I doing on time? What time is it? 12, 13. All right. So quickly, I want to de delve into Myth 6 just a little bit. In the book, and I've argued this since 2009, I've got a number of places online where I argue about this, and you would not believe the hate mail I receive. Um, I've, I've been arguing that lying to our children about Santa Claus is not the best parenting practice. Um, again, that doesn't mean you're a bad parent. You can just be a little bit better if you didn't participate in the lie, if you didn't trick your children uh, into believing. The reasons for this are, are multifaceted. Uh, for one, I just don't think it's a, it's, 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 it's a lie and it's not a justified lie. Not all lies are bad, uh, not all lies are wrong, but they have to have justifying consequences to them and the Santa Claus lie does not have those consequences. Um, yeah, it creates awe and wonder, but I could create awe and wonder in my children by tricking them into believing that Star Wars was real. That'd be awesome, they'd love that, to think the force was real and you could really have lightsaber. Wow, that would blow their minds. But we would all think I was a terrible parent if I actually tried to trick them into believing that Star, Wheel, Star Wars was actually real, right? I'm just saying the same thing about Santa Claus, right? Uh, the literal belief is just not a good idea. It's also, I think, bad parenting practice. Um, it, it has the possibility, of course, it doesn't always do this, but those, you can find anecdotes where this is not true, but anecdotal evidence is not very good evidence. Um, it has the potential to create trust issues between you and your parent, between the child and the parent. Right? Uh, because if you're lying to them about that, what else might you be lying about? Right? Um, interestingly, and I'm in the midst of kind of writing an article about this right now for an ethics center in Australia, um, it might be something that that trust issue might be something that's even more worrisome if your child is on the autism spectrum. Because children who are autistic have a little bit more trouble delineating those kinds of things and a little bit more rule based. And so if you're lying about this, you could be lying about just about anything else. And so there can be some issues. In fact, they sometimes they have trouble with lying themselves. They can't keep track of lies on their own. Um, and so this is one of the things that if your child's on the autism spectrum, this might be something to worry about because it could really create trust issues. Um, as one of my colleagues at King's puts it, uh, Joel Schumann, he didn't do this with his kids either. In fact, one of the things I should mention is you might think I'm outlandish for thinking that you shouldn't do this. Parents who don't do the lie are actually a lot more common than you think. I get emails all the time, and it's a little bit more anecdotal. I get a lot of emails from different people who've come across my work online saying, thank you for finally articulating the reason that we don't do this. My parents hate me because we don't do this with, you know, with their grandchildren, our children. Uh, but we don't want to lie to our kids. We have, we have the same worries that you do. Uh, it's a lot more common uh, than you would think. They just lay low because Santa Claus is such a sacred cow that to 
in a great hymn to suggest this kind of stuff can really promote vitriol. Right? I, would, I argue that he, he's more of a sacred cow than Jesus. He is more socially protected than Jesus. Uh, as some evidence, at least an intuition pump, um, American Atheist put up a, a billboard uh, a few years ago that you know, had the nativity scene and said, you know it's a myth. Right? And people were upset about it, and people put up some responding billboards, right? But nobody argued that they shouldn't have the legal right. I mean, somebody sold them the space, right? What if I were to try to put up a billboard that had a picture of Santa Claus and just said, it's a lie? <laughs> Would anyone even sell me the space? Yeah. Would there not be the laws passed to say that I couldn't do that kind of thing? Right? I, I think he's, he's, he's more sacred. Um, it's societally, he's more sacred. So, but the way Joel puts it, oh yeah, no, you're fine. Let's let's uh, uh this, let's go ahead and since you said, that's my boy Johnny. A chip off the old block. We tried to take a picture with Santa yesterday, and that's how he reacted. And I love it. I loved it. Um, that was just yesterday. That was just yesterday. So, um, go ahead, go ahead and go back to go back a slide there, because I'm I'm just going to kind of elaborate a bit on these uh, off the cuff. Um, the, the, second, the, the second reason uh, uh, that has to do with bad, with bad parenting is, as, as Joel puts it, gifts serve a certain kind of function um, in that they show the recipient that they are worth something, that they are worth something to the person who gave the gift, right? Um, you are worthy enough, you are worthwhile enough, and I value enough to give you this gift. Um, and so what gifts can and should do is reinforce the notion that children are valued by their parents. But if they think the gift came from Santa Claus, it loses that function. It doesn't reassure them. It reassures them that Santa loves them. Children don't need that reassurance. They need reassurance that their parents love them. And so it defeats the, the, the utility, basically, the function of gifts by making it from someone else. Right? Not to mention that parents kind of deserve the gratitude and children need more practice in, in doing that. Um, a lot of people will argue that the Santa Claus lie is actually good for children because it increases imagination. In fact, in the, in the book, I mentioned quite a few uh, psychologists and that kind of stuff who argue that, uh, that it's, that's good because it produces imagination. But the funny thing about those arguments is that what they always do to, to make those arguments is they point to literature that points out all the wonderful benefits of imagination and promoting imagination in kids. Of course, I would never argue with that. Imagination is wonderful, right? But the, the latent assumption in all these arguments that never gets any kind of support at all, it's just assumed, is that the Santa Claus lie promotes imagination. It doesn't. If you tr Does the Christian imagine that Jesus rose from the dead? No, they believe that he did. Does the, does the Muslim imagine that Muhammad rode a horse named Barak from Mecca to Jerusalem and then up into heaven? No, they believe that. What I'm objecting to is tricking children into believing that Santa Claus is literally a real physical person that physically visits the house. To imagine something, you have to pretend that it's real. And to pretend that it's real, you have to know that it's not real, but pretend that it is anyway. When you trick children into literally believing, you actually rob them of the opportunity to imagine Santa Claus exists, to pretend that he exists, because you're forcing the belief upon them. You're making them believe, right? If you, uh, uh, Pascal Emmanuel Gorby, uh, uh, Gabri puts it this way, if children really did imagine that Santa Claus existed, they'd all imagine a different version. They don't. They all imagine the version that we feed to them that's been fed to us by society, right? And so it locks off that opportunity. So if you want to, and this is probably what we'll do with Johnny, if you want to play the Santa game and pretend that he exists, that's perfectly fine. But as soon as the child's old enough to know the difference between fact and fiction and ask, don't trick them into believing it's actually real. Say, no, this is a fun game we're doing. It's pretend. We're pretending it's real. Do you have anything you want to add to the story that we can you know, pretend is real as well? That would be promoting imagination. But tricking children into literally believing something does not promote imagination. But what I'm most worried about uh, when it comes to the Santa Claus lie is credulity, a lack of critical thinking. Because, and I've heard people deny that this is what parents actually do. In my experience, this is most often what parents do. Child comes asking about the truth, truth about Santa Claus. What do parents usually do? They lie, right? But how does he fit through the chimney? It's magic, 
right? But how does he visit? Oh, and they'll come up with ridiculous explanations and cock stories and and but don't you want to believe it's fun right you don't want to I mean it's fun or it's more fun to believe that Santa Claus is real right and so believe for that reason these are all hallmarks of terrible critical thinking skills right believing magical explanations and bad explanations believing something because it's fun something go go a few slides in go let me let me find this keep going keep going keep going keep going keep going Find this slide, keep going, keep going. I think one more, another one, one more. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Something that highlights this, I think, like a neon sign is Search for Santa. This is an actual DVD, a movie that you can buy on Amazon called Search for Santa. It is a documentary that has actors playing scientists who profess to have scientific evidence that Santa Claus is real. A sleigh runner that they found in the desert. Well, how could a snow sleigh runner get in the desert unless it fell off of Santa's sleigh, right? A nine millimeter, or eight millimeter film that a little boy took as a child that caught Santa Claus in the action. They call it the Swoboda film is very much like the Bigfoot film, right, that that's been faked, right? Um, some other evidence that they put forth. And the, these people playing scientists literally equate gut feeling with scientific evidence, right? And the purpose of this DVD is literally, if your kids have stopped believing, show them this and you'll squeeze a couple more years of belief out of them, right? And I mean, what you're doing when you show them this is like, no, this, this is good evidence. This is what good evidence looks like. So believe for this reason. What's sad is that this mockumentary doesn't, isn't that much different than actual real documentaries, real documentaries, that you would find on the History Channel about Bigfoot and Megalodon exists today and mermaids and all kinds of other pseudoscientific junk that you'll find on the History Channel. It's no wonder that I have freshmen in my college critical thinking class that come in thinking that mermaids are real because they saw a documentary about it on the History Channel. We've taught them, we've encouraged them to be credulous. Let me put, I'll put it this way and then I'll, I'll take some questions. The reason that parents want to do this is because they see that moment when they stop believing in Santa Claus as this moment that their child is, is over because they've lost their naivete, right? And so we want to extend that childhood for as long as we possibly can. I think that shows a monumental this devaluing of critical thinking. If my little boy Johnny started walking two months early, I wouldn't say, Sit down, it's not time to walk yet. You're growing up too fast. I would say, no, he's walking early, that's awesome, right? If he starts talking early, I would not put tape on his mouth and say, it's too early to be talking. No, I encourage him to talk as early as I can. In fact, I model good language skills to him as much as I can long before, and I was long before he could even speak. I was reading him books whenever he was a month old, right? I mo even way before he could speak, I was modeling good language skills to him. We should be doing the same with critical thinking skills. Long before they can think, we should be modeling and encouraging critical thinking in them. And when they start to show signs of critical thinking, we wouldn't say, oh no, your childhood is over. I need to try to extend this for as long as, no, celebrate it. I'm so proud, little Johnny's only four and he already figured out that Santa Claus is real. He's a little genius. You should be proud of that. You should embrace that, right? So, and really this is, this is my, more than anything, this is, this is what this is about. My, my objection to the Santa Claus lie is about. If you still do the Santa Claus lie, but you recognize that critical thinking is something that you need to teach and instill in your children, that's what I really care about. That's what I think is the most important thing. The Santa Claus lie is kind of a, a, a vessel to get me to that, that, that conclusion. But that's something that, especially as humanists, who I know value critical thinking, we need to be instilling that in our kids even more. So 
that's a very brief version of, of chapter six there on the Santa Claus lie. So I'll leave it there and I'll take some questions. were afraid if they didn't believe they would get underwear. Right. <laughs> right, right, which, which even points to like, um, I mean, you wonder how much it's, it's Santa Claus that's so loved and if it's the gifts, right. right? Like, I mean, imagine doing the Santa Claus lie, but Santa Claus always gets you underwear, and the parents always get you the good, well, he wouldn't be so loved right. if that were the case, right? Um, go back. Well, she's got the mic right here, so we'll go there, and then the, and we'll work our way to the back. Yeah. Kyle, I want to thank you for this great speech. Thanks. And I also want to say to you that I don't know if anyone else will confess to this, but I'm probably, the reason I'm here is probably due to exactly the discussion you've just had. Because when my parents told me at age four or five that there was no Santa Claus, I immediately said, then there's no Jesus, right? <laughs> when, and my mother, in her late 80s, told my sister, I made a big mistake with Richard. <laughs> I told him that there was a Santa Claus, and he said to me, you lied to me. And he said that for three solid years <laughs> in every conversation about what you believe. Yep. And I still believe that that was the turning point in my life, and I will tell people that. Yeah, uh, a lot of, whenever I give this uh, talk at different places, uh, like I've, I've given it at a Unitarian church before, um, one of the points I make is that, you know, some people will say, don't you want to encourage your children to have faith in things like Santa Claus? And I say, if Santa Claus is not the way to go for that, if you want that, because exactly what you're describing can happen, right? Um, other people have suggested that we should lie to our kids about Santa Claus. Like humanists have suggested that we should lie to our kids about Santa Claus because it once they learn, they'll realize that they shouldn't trust authority figures, right? And that's a really good critical thinking lesson, right? Uh, um, and so I kind of, I, I, well, basically my response to that is that um, that's, a good, that's a good point, but they should trust their parents. And so a way to make them not trust authority figures is, is to say, I'm going to tell you the truth about Santa Claus. Notice how everybody else is not, right? Uh, and you kind of get that same lesson. That's a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing. Yes, sir. Yeah, there's a uh, 2011 film called A Christmas Tale which is the story of Krampus. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to rate it kind of as a horror movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's available on a Netflix DVD. You can't get it, it streaming, okay, but okay. you can get the uh, DVD from it. What's it called again? A Christmas Tale. Christmas Tale. Yeah. Uh, is it T-A-I-L or T-A-L-E? Oh, T-A-L-E, okay. But he has horns and everything else. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah and in fact, um, there's a number of Krampus movies that have started popping up. I haven't heard of that one. Um, there's another one called Krampus the Christmas Devil that came out a couple of years ago. That is a horror movie. And then there's one that came out this year called Krampus that I went and saw on Friday. Um, and it's, it was pretty good. Uh, Krampus looked amazing in it. Um, there's another one out that may have gone straight to DVD that has William Shatner in it called Christmas a Horror Story. Um, apparently Krampus tears up William Shatner. I can't wait to see it. Uh, and there's a couple more coming out. So it's becoming more and more popular, I think partly due to, to Monty Bichamp. Uh, work in his, in his books on, on Krampus. Um, but I've seen it started, I, I don't know how in the world I could take, possibly take credit for this, so Chris correlation does not entail causation, but around the time I started studying this stuff, like that very year, I saw a first article on, and maybe this is some confirmation bias, but I saw uh, uh, an article in the National Geographic, and then he was on the Colbert Report, and then he starts popping up in different places. He was on American Dad a couple of years ago, and now we've got Hollywood movies about him, right? So he's really kind of taking off in American culture uh, in a very kind of fascinating way. Um, two questions. Sure. One, what is the origin of the name Chris Kringle? Good question. Okay. And second, um, what about um, celebrating other holidays on December 25th uh, for anybody who's so disgusted by all of this facade? Right, right. Good. Something like Newton Miss or such. Right, as. right, right. I mean, oh, I like your shirt, by the way. I'm, I'm festive. A big, yeah, I'm a big Hoovian. Um, so, uh, yeah, so let's go to the latter, the latter question first. Um, in, in the book, I argue this, I argued this a bit last time when I was here talking about Christmas. Um, I argue that uh, Christmas is not a Christian holiday. Um, even though it's got the name Christ in it, it does not make it a Christian holiday. Uh, just like the fact that Sunday has the word sun, it doesn't mean that people who worship on Sunday are worshiping the sun, even though that's where the name came from. Uh, and in fact, the Christians moved their holy day of worship 
from the Jewish Sabbath to Sunday to accommodate sun worshipers because that's when they were worshiping. So back in the 4th and 5th century, they moved their holy day of worship to Sunday. But that doesn't mean they're worshiping the sun. And just because it's called Christmas doesn't mean that it's about Christ, right? Uh, Christmas is about the way we celebrate it, and it's never been celebrated primarily in a Christian way. Right? Uh, so basically, see if, I can, see if I can answer your question in this way. In the book, basically what I argue is this. Christmas does not belong to anyone. It does not belong to Christians. It doesn't belong to humanists. It doesn't belong to pagans. It doesn't belong to anyone. It's just a natural, it, it, it stems back from traditions that are just a natural response to when the days start getting longer and the days start getting colder. Um, and most of the ways that we celebrate today are pretty new. Or most of them were invented fairly recently, a lot of time by retail and kind of consumeristic forces, right? And so if you want to abandon any of that, do. Celebrate in whatever way you want to. Call it Christmas. Call it something else. There's no wrong way to celebrate Christmas. And so I object to, like, you know, mantras like, keep Christ in Christmas, right? If you want to put Christ in Christmas, that's fine. Celebrate it all that way, that's fine. But if I don't, I'm not doing it the wrong way because Christians don't own the holiday. Never, they never have, and I don't think they ever will. It's never been celebrated primarily in a Christian way. Did that answer your second question to your satisfaction? Cool. Um, yeah, maybe Coca-Cola. If anybody owns a Coca-Cola does, right? Um, an answer to your first question, where Chris Kringle comes from. Um, it was, uh, let's see, let's go uh, see if we can go back here. Where's that picture? Oh, I went the wrong way. There's Johnny again. Let's find... This child, we're getting close. Come on. There she is. All right. So this actually also explains why, how this tradition that was on December 6th today got moved to December 24th. All right. So here's what happened. Is during the Protestant Reformation, again, Protestants are wanting to kick out Santa Claus, St. Nicholas. They don't have any, they don't have any room for the, the Catholic saint. But they still like the tradition. And so what they do is they invent a new gift giver that's going to, and they're going to make it more about Jesus and Jesus' birth on December 25th. So they invent a new gift giver. Now, who could that gift giver be? Well, if it's in honor of Jesus, it needs to be Jesus. So they need the Christ child to come and visit. Now, of course, a little infant can't actually deliver gifts, but to represent the Christ child's meekness and mildness, they cast a young, usually blonde, female that often had candles in her hair, not always. And they called her the Chris Kindle, the Christ child. All right? And this, so they move the tradition, they take St. Nicholas out of it, they move the tradition to December 24th, and they try to replace St. Nicholas with the Christ child. All right? Problem is, lame. This is just a lame tradition. Nobody likes it. The Christ child is not nearly as exciting as these two. Right? And so, even though they're Protestant, St. Nicholas starts showing up with the Chris Crindle, uh, along with Krampus or the wild man in tow. And so at first, the Chris Crindle is kind of still in the, in the front and there in the back. But over time, he becomes more popular. So she just kind of, and you can see her here, she's kind of in the background here as well. And then eventually, that's just phased out. And St. Nicholas has a new name, Chris Crindle. Chris Kringle. That make sense? That explains two things. It explains that name, then it explains how the tradition got moved to the 24th. Cool. Isn't this fun? I love this stuff. We have time for one more question. Uh, there's two people who've already asked questions before, so. Um, Anybody else? Oh, here we go. There we go. The economic aspect of it, that the poor child gets lousy presents. Yes. And the rich child gets ridiculously right lavish so, presence yeah yeah um, and how that must make the poor child feel yep especially if they're not old enough to be smart enough to start questioning so this actually happened to me it's one of the things i mentioned in the book is i remember quite distinctly that there was kind of a jerk bully in the class whose parents were rich and every christmas after break he would come back spinning these wild tales about all the stuff that he had got and i remember thinking well uh, how does that work this guy's an asshole right like <laughs> how, how was santa doing this, right? And fortunately, at the time, I was old enough to think, well, then maybe Santa Claus isn't actually real instead of, like, you know, altering my moral compass, right? Um, but this is actually another worry I have about the lie is that, I mean, we, all, we can all see some dangers in making kids greedy. We've seen 
what Christmas parent, what Christmas presents can do to kids and how greedy it can make them and how entitled uh, it can make them, right? And so if we're literally teaching them that that kind of reward is like the reason to be good is to get that kind of reward, what happens when they get out in the real world and realize actually it's cheating that gets you the reward, right? Being good doesn't always, you know, no good deed goes unpunished, right? And if, if we t we're teaching them to behave based on this reward-based system, that can, that can have detrimental consequences, right? But in the book, I also argue about the economic impact of Christmas. And everybody says, including Sarah Palin, um, who, by the way, I read her book, Good Tidings, Great Joy. I read it so that I could incorporate, you know, uh, respond to it, basically, in the book. Interesting fact about Good Tidings and Great Joy, not one footnote or endnote. <laughs> not one. Um, I have very, I have a lot. My, my book is very, very, very well sourced. Um, so, but, I mean, she says that the, that the, uh, uh, the economy, uh, the Christmas spending props the economy up, our retail economy, it props it up. Uh, and that basically, it, you know, if Christmas spending went away, uh, it would be detrimental uh, to the economy. So Christmas spending is good for the economy. It's kind of empty and consumeristic as it is. And I argue against that directly in the book and say, no, it's not. And we would all, including our economy, would actually be better off if we didn't do Christmas spending. But if you're interested in that, I'll let you pick up the book. Um, I have them for sale over here. I'm selling them for the same price. You can find them on Amazon, uh, 15 bucks. Um, it's actually a penny more. It's $14.99. So my signature's worth a penny. If you want me to pay me more for my signature, that's great. Uh, but I have uh, about 16 copies over there. I have a couple more in my, in my car if I end up running out. But I can even take credit cards if you're interested in... Yeah. I have a little app on my phone, if so. Uh, but uh, um, I'll be... Save on shipping. Yeah, you can save on shipping. That's right. So, but I'll be over there if you want a copy, and I'll sign it for you. And It sounds um, like it's a book that has lots of photos in it. <laughs> Yes, it does. A number so of the, not, this one's in there. There's a number of them. Not all of them are in there. It's not um, something you want to get on Kindle. Yeah. No, is well, it available? Kindle does. Yes, it is on Kindle. Okay. Uh, and you, and the pictures are in Kindle as well. They, they, should, they should be anyway. Okay. Um, they should be there. I'll let you but, know if they're not. Um, the, be, the better version is in print, uh, I think. Uh, and there's some pictures that are in the book that are not in here that are wonderful. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kyle.